Chapters ten to twelve of the story of my misfortunes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Martin Geeson. The story of my misfortunes by Peter Abelard, translated by Henry Adams Bellows. Chapter ten. Straightway upon my summons I went to the council, and there, without further examination or debate, did they compel me with my own hand to cast that memorable book of mine into the flames. Although my enemies appeared to have nothing to say while the book was burning, one of them muttered something about having seen it written therein that god the father was alone omnipotent this reached the ears of the legate who replied in astonishment that he could not believe that even a child would make so absurd a blunder our common faith he said holds and sets forth that the three are alike omnipotent a certain Tyric, a schoolmaster, hearing this, sarcastically added the Athanasian phrase, and yet there are not three omnipotent persons, but only one. This man's bishop forthwith began to censure him, bidding him desist from such treasonable talk, but he boldly stood his ground, and said, as if quoting the words of Daniel, are ye such fools, ye sons of Israel, that without examination or knowledge of the truth ye have condemned a daughter of Israel? Return again to the place of judgment. Daniel chapter 13 verse 48, the history of Susanna. And there give judgment on the judge himself. You have set up this judge forsooth, for the instruction of faith and the correction of error, and yet, when he ought to give judgment, he condemns himself out of his own mouth. Set free to-day, with the help of God's mercy, one who is manifestly innocent, even as Susanna was freed of old from her false accusers. Thereupon the archbishop arose and confirmed the legate's statement, but changed the wording thereof, as indeed was most fitting. It is God's truth, he said, that the Father is omnipotent, the Son is omnipotent, the Holy Spirit is omnipotent, and whosoever dissents from this is openly in error, and must not be listened to. Nevertheless, if it be your pleasure, it would be well that this our brother should publicly state before us all the faith that is in him, to the end that, according to his deserts, it may either be approved or else condemned and corrected. When, however, I fain would have arisen to profess and set forth my faith, in order that I might express in my own words that which was in my heart, my enemies declared that it was not needful for me to do more than recite the Athanasian symbol, a thing which any boy might do as well as I. And lest I should allege ignorance, pretending that I did not know the words by heart, they had a copy of it set before me to read. And read it I did as best I could for my groans and sighs and tears. Thereupon, as if I had been a convicted criminal, I was handed over to the abbot of saint Médard, who was there present, and led to his monastery as to a prison. And with this the council was immediately dissolved. The abbot and the monks of the aforesaid monastery, thinking that I would remain long with them, received me with great exultation and diligently sought to console me, but all in vain. O oh God, who dost judge justice itself, in what venom of the spirit, in what bitterness of mind, did I blame even thee for my shame, accusing thee in my madness? 
full often did i repeat the lament of st anthony kindly jesus where wert thou the sorrow that tortured me the shame that overwhelmed me the desperation that racked my mind all these i could then feel but even now i can find no words to express them comparing these new sufferings of my soul with those i had formerly endured in my body it seemed that i was in very truth the most miserable among men indeed that earlier betrayal had become a little thing in comparison with this later evil and i lamented the hurt to my fair name far more than the one to my body the latter indeed i had brought upon myself through my own wrong-doing but this other violence had come upon me solely by reason of the honesty of my purpose and my love of our faith which had compelled me to write that which i believed the very cruelty and heartlessness of my punishment however made every one who heard the story vehement in censuring it so that those who had a hand therein were soon eager to disclaim all responsibility shouldering the blame on others nay matters came to such a pass that even my rivals denied that they had had anything to do with the matter and as for the legate he publicly denounced the malice with which the french had acted swayed by repentance for his injustice and feeling that he had yielded enough to satisfy their rancour he shortly freed me from the monastery whither i had been taken and sent me back to my own here however i found almost as many enemies as i had in the former days of which i have already spoken for the vileness and shamelessness of their way of living made them realize that they would again have to endure my censure after a few months had passed chance gave them an opportunity by which they sought to destroy me it happened that one day in the course of my reading i came upon a certain passage of bede in his commentary on the acts of the apostles wherein he asserts that dionysius the areopagite was the bishop not of athens but of corinth now this was directly counter to the belief of the monks who were wont to boast that their dionysius or denis was not only the areopagite but was likewise proved by his acts to have been the bishop of athens having thus found this testimony of beads in contradiction of our own tradition i showed it somewhat jestingly to sundry of the monks who chanced to be near wrathfully they declared that bede was no better than a liar and that they had a far more trustworthy authority in the person of ildouin a former abbot of theirs who had travelled for a long time throughout greece for the purpose of investigating this very question he they insisted had by his writings removed all possible doubt on the subject and had securely established the truth of the traditional belief one of the monks went so far as to ask me brazenly which of the two bede or ildouin i considered the better authority on this point i replied that the authority of bede whose writings are held in high esteem by the whole latin church appeared to me the better thereupon in a great rage they began to cry out that at last i had openly proved the hatred i had always felt for our monastery and that i was seeking to disgrace it in the eyes of the whole kingdom robbing it of the honour in which it had particularly gloried by thus denying that the areopagite was their patron saint to this i answered that i had never denied the fact and that i did not much care whether their patron was the areopagite or some one else provided only he had received his crown from god 
thereupon they ran to the abbot and told him of the misdemeanour with which they charged me the abbot listened to their story with delight rejoicing at having found a chance to crush me for the greater vileness of his life made him fear me even more than the rest did accordingly he summoned his counsel and when the brethren had assembled he violently threatened me declaring that he would straightway send me to the king by him to be punished for having thus sullied his crown and the glory of his royalty and until he should hand me over to the king he ordered that i should be closely guarded in vain did i offer to submit to the customary discipline if i had in any way been guilty then horrified at their wickedness which seemed to crown the ill fortune i had so long endured and in utter despair at the apparent conspiracy of the whole world against me i fled secretly from the monastery by night helped thereto by some of the monks who took pity on me and likewise aided by some of my scholars i made my way to a region where i had formerly dwelt hard by the lands of count theobald of champagne he himself had some slight acquaintance with me and had compassion on me by reason of my persecutions of which the story had reached him i found a home there within the walls of province in a priory of the monks of troyes the prior of which had in former days known me well and shown me much love in his joy at my coming he cared for me with all diligence it chanced however that one day my abbot came to province to see the count on certain matters of business as soon as i had learned of this i went to the count the prior accompanying me and besought him to intercede in my behalf with the abbot i asked no more than that the abbot should absolve me of the charge against me and give me permission to live the monastic life wheresoever i could find a suitable place the abbot however and those who were with him took the matter under advisement saying that they would give the count an answer the day before they departed it appeared from their words that they thought i wished to go to some other abbey a thing which they regarded as an immense disgrace to their own they had indeed taken particular pride in the fact that upon my conversion i had come to them as if scorning all other abbeys and accordingly they considered that it would bring great shame upon them if i should now desert their abbey and seek another for this reason they refused to listen either to my own plea or to that of the count furthermore they threatened me with excommunication unless i should instantly return likewise they forbade the prior with whom i had taken refuge to keep me longer under pain of sharing my excommunication when we heard this both the prior and i were stricken with fear the abbot went away still obdurate but a few days thereafter he died as soon as his successor had been named i went to him accompanied by the bishop of meaux to try if i might win from him the permission i had vainly sought of his predecessor at first he would not give his assent but finally through the intervention of certain friends of mine i secured the right to appeal to the king and his council and in this way i at last obtained what i sought the royal seneschal stephen having summoned the abbot and his subordinates that they might state their case asked them why they wanted to keep me against my will he pointed out that this might easily bring them into evil repute and certainly could do them no good seeing that their way of living was utterly incompatible with mine i knew it to be the opinion of the royal council that the irregularities in the conduct of this abbey 
would tend to bring it more and more under the control of the king, making it increasingly useful and likewise profitable to him, and for this reason I had good hope of easily winning the support of the king and those about him. Thus indeed did it come to pass. But in order that the monastery might not be shorn of any of the glory which it had enjoyed by reason of my sojourn there, they granted me permission to betake myself to any solitary place I might choose, provided only I did not put myself under the rule of any other abbey. This was agreed upon, and confirmed on both sides in the presence of the king and his counsellors. Forthwith, I sought out a lonely spot, known to me of old in the region of Troyes, and there, on a bit of land which had been given to me, and with the approval of the bishop of the district, I built with reeds and stalks my first oratory in the name of the Holy Trinity, and there concealed, with but one comrade, a certain cleric, I was able to sing over and over again to the Lord, Lo, then would I wander far off and remain in the wilderness. Psalm 4, verse 7 Chapter 9 No sooner had scholars learned of my retreat than they began to flock thither from all sides, leaving their towns and castles to dwell in the wilderness. In place of their spacious houses they built themselves huts. Instead of dainty fare they lived on the herbs of the field and coarse bread. Their soft beds they exchanged for heaps of straw and rushes, and their tables were piles of turf. In very truth, you may well believe that they were like those philosophers of old, of whom Jerome tells us in his second book against Jovinianus. Through the senses, says Jerome, as through so many windows, do vices win entrance to the soul. The metropolis and citadel of the mind cannot be taken unless the army of the foe has first rushed in through the gates. If any one delights in the games of the circus, in the contests of athletes, in the versatility of actors, in the beauty of women, in the glitter of gems and raiment, or in aught else like to these, then the freedom of his soul is made captive through the windows of his eyes, and thus is fulfilled the prophecy, for death is come up into our windows. Jeremiah chapter 9 verse 21 And then, when the wedges of doubt have, as it were, been driven into the citadels of our minds through these gateways, where will be its liberty, where its fortitude, where its thought of God? Most of all does the sense of touch paint for itself the pictures of past raptures, compelling the soul to dwell fondly upon remembered iniquities, and so to practice in imagination those things which reality denies to it. Heeding such counsel, therefore, many among the philosophers forsook the thronging ways of the cities and the pleasant gardens of the countryside, with their well-watered fields, their shady trees, the song of birds, the mirror of the fountain, the murmur of the stream, the many charms for eye and ear, fearing lest their souls should grow soft amid luxury and abundance of riches, and lest their virtue should thereby be defiled. For it is perilous to turn your eyes often to those things whereby you may some day be made captive or to attempt the possession of that which it would go hard with you to do without. Thus the Pythagoreans shunned all companionship of this kind, and were wont to dwell in solitary and desert places. Nay, Plato himself, although he was a rich man, let Diogenes trample on his couch with muddy feet, 
and in order that he might devote himself to philosophy established his academy in a place remote from the city and not only uninhabited but unhealthy as well this he did in order that the onslaughts of lust might be broken by the fear and constant presence of disease and that his followers might find no pleasure save in the things they learned such a life likewise the sons of the prophets who were the followers of eliseus are reported to have led of these jerome also tells us writing thus to the monk rusticus as if describing the monks of those ancient days the sons of the prophets the monks of whom we read in the old testament built for themselves huts by the waters of the jordan and forsaking the throngs and the cities lived on pottage and the herbs of the field epistolae four even so did my followers build their huts above the waters of the Arduzon, so that they seemed hermits rather than scholars and as their number grew ever greater the hardships which they gladly endured for the sake of my teaching seemed to my rivals to reflect new glory on me and to cast new shame on themselves nor was it strange that they who had done their utmost to hurt me should grieve to see how all things worked together for my good even though i was now in the words of jerome afar from cities and the market-place from controversies and the crowded ways of men and so as quintilian says did envy seek me out even in my hiding-place secretly my rivals complained and lamented one to another saying behold now the whole world runs after him and our persecution of him has done naught save to increase his glory we strove to extinguish his fame and we have but given it new brightness lo in the city scholars have at hand everything they may need and yet spurning the pleasures of the town they seek out the barrenness of the desert and of their own free will they accept wretchedness the thing which at that time chiefly led me to undertake the direction of a school was my intolerable poverty for i had not strength enough to dig and shame kept me from begging and so resorting once more to the art with which i was so familiar i was compelled to substitute the service of the tongue for the labour of my hands the students willingly provided me with whatsoever i needed in the way of food and clothing and likewise took charge of the cultivation of the fields and paid for the erection of buildings in order that material cares might not keep me from my studies since my oratory was no longer large enough to hold even a small part of their number they found it necessary to increase its size and in so doing they greatly improved it building it of stone and wood although this oratory had been founded in honour of the holy trinity and afterwards dedicated thereto i now named it the paraclete mindful of how i had come there a fugitive and in despair and had breathed into my soul something of the miracle of divine consolation many of those who heard of this were greatly astonished and some violently assailed my action declaring that it was not permissible to dedicate a church exclusively to the holy spirit rather than to god the father they held according to an ancient tradition that it must be dedicated either to the son alone or else to the entire trinity the error which led them into this false accusation resulted from their failure to perceive the identity of the paraclete with the spirit paraclete 
even as the whole trinity or any person in the trinity might rightly be called god or helper so likewise it may be termed the paraclete that is to say the consoler these are the words of the apostle blessed be god even the father of our lord jesus christ the father of mercies and the god of all comfort who comforteth us in all our tribulation two corinthians chapter one verse three and likewise the word of truth says and he shall give you another comforter greek another paraclete john chapter fourteen verse sixteen nay since every church is consecrated equally in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit without any difference in their possession thereof why should not the house of god be dedicated to the father or to the holy spirit even as it is dedicated to the son who would presume to erase from above the door the name of him who is the master of the house and since the son offered himself as a sacrifice to the father and accordingly in the ceremonies of the mass the prayers are offered particularly to the father and the immolation of the host is made to him why should not the altar be held to be chiefly his to whom above all the supplication and sacrifice are made is it not called more rightly the altar of him who receives than of him who makes the sacrifice who would admit that an altar is that of the holy cross or of the sepulchre or of st michael or john or peter or of any other saint unless either he himself was sacrificed there or else special sacrifices and prayers are made there to him methinks the altars and temples of certain ones among these saints are not held to be idolatrous even though they are used for special sacrifices and prayers to their patrons some however may perchance argue that churches are not built or altars dedicated to the father because there is no feast which is solemnized especially for him but while this reasoning holds good as regards the trinity itself it does not apply in the case of the holy spirit for this spirit from the day of its advent has had its special feast of the pentecost even as the sun has had since his coming upon earth his feast of the nativity even as the sun was sent into this world so did the holy spirit descend upon the disciples and thus does it claim its special religious rites nay it seems more fitting to dedicate a temple to it than to either of the other persons of the trinity if we but carefully study the apostolic authority and consider the workings of this spirit itself to none of the three persons did the apostle dedicate a special temple save to the holy spirit alone he does not speak of a temple of the father or a temple of the son as he does of a temple of the holy spirit writing thus in his first epistle to the corinthians but he that is joined unto the lord is one spirit one corinthians chapter six verse seventeen and again what know ye not that your body is the temple of the holy spirit which is in you which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. Ibidem 19. Who is there who does not know that the sacraments of God's blessings pertaining to the church are particularly ascribed to the operation of divine grace, by which is meant the Holy Spirit? Forsooth we are born again of water and of the Holy Spirit in baptism and thus from the very beginning is the body made as it were a special temple of god in the successive sacraments moreover the sevenfold grace of the spirit is added whereby this same temple of god is made beautiful and is consecrated what wonder is it then 
if to that person to whom the apostle assigned a spiritual temple we should dedicate a material one or to what person can a church be more rightly said to belong than to him to whom all the blessings which the church administers are particularly ascribed it was not however with the thought of dedicating my oratory to one person that i first called it the paraclete but for the reason i have already told that in this spot i found consolation none the less even if i had done it for the reason attributed to me the departure from the usual custom would have been in no way illogical chapter twelve and so i dwelt in this place my body indeed hidden away but my fame spreading throughout the whole world till its echo reverberated mightily echo that fancy of the poets which has so great a voice and naught beside my former rivals seeing that they themselves were now powerless to do me hurt stirred up against me certain new apostles in whom the world put great faith one of these norbert of Prémontré, took pride in his position as a canon of a regular order the other bernard of clairvaux made it his boast that he had revived the true monastic life these two ran hither and yon preaching and shamelessly slandering me in every way they could so that in time they succeeded in drawing down on my head the scorn of many among those having authority among both the clergy and the laity they spread abroad such sinister reports of my faith as well as of my life that they turned even my best friends against me and those who still retained something of their former regard for me were fain to disguise it in every possible way by reason of their fear of these two men god is my witness that whensoever i learned of the convening of a new assemblage of the clergy i believed that it was done for the express purpose of my condemnation stunned by this fear like one smitten with a thunderbolt i daily expected to be dragged before their councils or assemblies as a heretic or one guilty of impiety though i seem to compare a flea with a lion or an ant with an elephant in very truth my rivals persecuted me no less bitterly than the heretics of old hounded saint athanasius often god knows i sank so deep in despair that i was ready to leave the world of christendom and go forth among the heathen paying them a stipulated tribute in order that i might live quietly a christian life among the enemies of christ it seemed to me that such people might indeed be kindly disposed towards me particularly as they would doubtless suspect me of being no good christian imputing my flight to some crime i had committed and would therefore believe that i might perhaps be won over to their form of worship End of chapter 12 Recording by Martin Giessen In Hazelmere, Surrey